ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ukraine Crisis Media Center. I'm just going to go over uh, the schedule to the end of the day. Um, so at noon, we will uh, s very soon, in a few minutes, start with a press briefing dedicated to the start of the conference Ukraine uh, Thinking Together. I will introduce uh, speakers in a second. At one o'clock, we will have Igor Sobolev with us. He is head of illustration committee of Ukraine. At 2 o'clock, we will have Beryl Rodal, Chairman of the Advisory Board of Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, and Adrian Karatnitsky, Member of the Board of Directors and Co-Director of Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. At uh, 3.30, we will have with us uh, Carl Bildt, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, and uh, we will finish the day with a press briefing at 4.15 uh, from Ira Forman, U.S. Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Anti-Semitism in Ukraine. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, introduce our uh, speakers and guests uh, for the next press briefing. It's dedicated to the start of the conference of Ukraine Thinking Together. We are honored uh, to have at Ukraine Crisis Media Center, uh, Timothy Snyder, historian, professor of history at Yale University, a permanent fellow of the Institute of Human Science in Vienna. Uh, Leon Bieseltier, uh, writer, literary editor of the New Republic magazine, and Mr. Jerzy Pomianowski, Executive Director of the European Endowment for Democracy. Please. Okay, Timon, you start. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I'm very glad to be here myself, but above all, I'm very glad to be here with my friends and colleagues from the West and also from Russia. The idea of this conference, um, Ukraine Thinking Together, Mislite z Ukrainoyu, is above all to demonstrate solidarity, to demonstrate that Kiev is a place where people from around the world want to come, um, partly because we want to be with be seen with and see our Ukrainian colleagues and friends to express our respect for what they have done and also our respect and interest in the way they are thinking about the new Ukraine in art, in literature, in journalism, as well as in scholarship. So we're here to be with the people we regard as our friends, our colleagues, and our equals. We're also here because we think that Ukraine right now apart from all of its troubles, aside from all of its challenges with which, which we see and with which we sympathize, has become perhaps the most interesting place in the world. A place where the serious discussions of ethics and politics and culture should take place, must take place, and can take place. So we're not here just to arrive and to shake hands. We're here to carry out a series of very, of very serious conversations at the Diplomatic Academy and at the Mohelanka over the courses of the next couple of days in mixed panels with Ukrainians and Westerners and Russians together, all of us speaking European languages, that is to say Ukrainian, Russian, German, French, English, and Polish, in the hope that we will have discussions that are addressing the main questions of the day, what the culture is like after, Ma after the Maidan, what human rights mean in the context of a Russian intervention, what geopolitics has in store for all of us, what is history and what is memory, in the hope that we can do this at a very high level in a way that demonstrates what we and Ukrainians can do together. Thank you very much. Uh, I would add, I agree with everything my friend Tim said. Um, the world has too many interesting places these days. Um, it is a great honor, a great honor, I say that without any irony or charm, it is a great honor to be here. Um, right now, Ukraine, Kiev, the Maidan, this is one of the primary sites of the most fundamental struggle there is in the world today, which is the struggle for democracy and pluralism. Um, the Maidan is now some of the hallowed ground in the history of the modern struggle for democracy and pluralism. The idea of this conference was basically that we did not wish to sit back where we were in our various places in the West uh, and sympathize silently. We wanted to come here and offer solidarity and support um, to say that you are not alone, even though I wish I could speak for my 
country's government and more of my country in saying that. But certainly as regards the people who are here, we are here to say that you are not alone. Um, that we follow what your struggle is about, that we support your struggle, we share your values. We are inspired by what you are doing. Um, as Tim said, we are here both to express solidarity and show support and to do the work of analysis and understanding. Uh, the issues that you face are enormously complex. Um, philosophically, they have easy answers, but practically and politically, they do not have easy answers. And what we intend to do in this conference, alongside with demonstrating our solidarity with you and your ideals, is to try to speak to each other, to listen to each other, and to understand what it would take for you to realize the ideals that you have expressed in this revolution. Um, I regard this as one of the primary moments in the history of the 21st century. By this, I mean what's happening in Ukraine um, for many, many reasons. And it's a moment that needs to be carefully analyzed. And it is one of those moments in which one has to choose sides. Uh, in which one has to choose sides. This is one of those conflicts in which you cannot agree with both sides. Um, and we have chosen our sides. And we're here, as I say, to meet with our friends, to discuss these things. Um, what we said. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What now? Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here with uh, such uh, wise people like Leon and Timothy. I'm coming from Poland. I now work in Brussels, uh, leading European Endowment for Democracy, and we are very proud to support this conference. And we are, as it was already said, coming here out of uh, solidarity. And I would uh, strongly expect that those group of extremely wise people that we'll be discussing today, they will provide us with a few important answers. One of those answers is how to make Europe and the world united in front of Ukraine crisis. Because if Europe and the world is not united, then we need to quote the great Polish thinker, Jerzy Gedrych, who once said there is no free, Ukraine, free Poland without free Ukraine. And I should uh, now extend the saying, there is no bright future for Europe if Europe is not united and the world is not united in front of Ukraine crisis and in responding to Russia aggression. So I strongly believe uh, all discussions that we can have uh, during these days will help us to send a message both here to Moscow, but also to the capitals uh, in the world, especially in Europe and uh, over Atlantic. The second uh, question is how to really explain that solidarity is a key world that should lead all of us in these uh, difficult days. And I strongly believe that uh, solidarity, as we are coming out of here today to meet our Ukrainian friends and all over the world people that are ready to think together, I also believe that we should fight strongly all kind of caricatures of the solidarity as we could see uh, the armed men sent to the east of Ukraine from Russia. And every phenomenon has its caricature as uh, the Putinism is caricature of uh, democracy. So in that sense, uh, we should, using the wisdom of the best people, make this line very clear. And the third, I would like to say, especially here in this symbolic place where we are sitting just next to Institutska Street, that society is in driving seat. So we need to advise every politician in Ukraine and every member of the society that is society in driving seat. And I strongly believe that this is already well consolidated here in Ukraine. And I strongly believe there will be no excuse, whether it's security threat, economic threat, there will be no excuse for politicians in Ukraine to go back out of this road and to limit space for democracy and for the civic activism. And that's what I expect also from our great minds that we'll be discussing to consolidate this message and to ensure that this is exactly the wisdom we propose and we share with our Ukrainian friends. Thank you very much. Thank you. If possible, maybe we could open to a few questions from the good, audience. Good, Please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mirek Toda. I'm a journalist from Slovakia, from Daily Sme. Uh, 
in one week there will be presidential elections here. Uh, how important do you see they will be? And if you think they will succeed, they will be fair and they will be uh, okay? I, 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 I'm not a close student. I mean, I, I, should, I should say, by the way, I do not speak or read Ukrainian, which makes me feel a bit like a fool sometimes. But um, the most important thing is that Ukrainians continue to express their popular will and continue to make it clear uh, to themselves, first and foremost, and to Putin and to the West, to the rest of the world, what sort of society they wish to live in and what sort of state they wish to have. That, for me, I think is the most important thing. Um, Insofar as your, your purpose is clear to yourselves and to others, you are strong. Um, I don't know, I, I'm Tim, my friends here can probably speak more to the details of the election. I think the election is important because of when it's happening, because of the circumstances in which it's happening, and because it is another opportunity, an important opportunity, for the rest of the world to understand just what Ukraine wants and how strongly it wants it, and how I hope united it is behind those goals. Um, the, the, you know, a united Ukraine behind democratic and pluralistic ideals is, um, is I would like to think, an irresistible partner for people in the West to support. Uh, but I'll leave it to my friends to talk about the details. I think. Barring some disaster, which of course can't be excluded, the presidential elections will take place, I think, in almost all of this country. They're very important for three reasons, I think. The first is that, as Leon said, it's important to demonstrate what kind of country you want to be. A country which tries to hold presidential elections, even under difficult circumstances, is impressive in a certain way. A country that tries to stop democratic elections by exerting pressure is impressive in a different way. So that's a distinction which we're able to observe. The second reason why these elections are important is that very serious changes have taken place in Ukrainian political and social life. Not just the Maidan, but people's reactions to the Maidan. This, in a national election like the election for president, people from Odessa to Poltava, people from, I hope, Donetsk to Lviv, will have a chance to express their opinion. For the same reason, I think, that parliamentary elections this year would be a good idea. It's not legally required, but so much has changed in Ukraine that I think nationwide participation is very important. And the third reason why I think these elections matter is that this is a chance for um, the state to demonstrate that it can do something. The crucial question, I mean, it's less, it, it, it's less talked about than other things that are more colorful, but the crucial question for the future of Ukraine is the functioning of the Ukrainian state. A, a non-corrupt, law-observing, predictable, if you like, bureaucratic Ukrainian state. Carrying out presidential elections is an exercise in, what's, in what states do. And I believe, that, I believe the state will be up to the task. Let me just add to it that election is the simplest and most correct way to make society speak. And uh, Ukrainian society already has spoken here in Maidan, but now we need all nations to speak through election process. And that's exactly what is happening. And as soon as it happens, better for Ukraine. The next, qu uh, the next question will be uh, yeah, in, in Russian. In Russian, I, I, I believe. In Russian. Just in case you might need some of the headsets. Международный отдел радиостанции Майданом. Понеже, скажите, пожалуйста, ваша программа европейской поддержки демократии в Украине как-нибудь отразилась на Майдане? Была такая помощь Майдану? If you allow me, I will answer in Russian. Конечно, Европейский фонд за демократию. Он образован, чтобы помогать всем, которые а, хотят восстановить демократию в своих а, странах, и в том же числе тоже в Украине. А, мы, конечно, и помогали, и будем помогать. Но наша помощь, это как солидарность, она основана на этих самых ценностях и основана на прозрачной помощи. Когда помогаем, всегда говорим «кому», помогаем и э, в каком виде. Как я раньше говорил э, по-английски, общество сейчас решает будущее 
Украины. И надо помогать украинскому обществу, чтобы она была в состоянии точно свой месседж для политиков и производить, и облекать в те все важные слова, которыми нуждаются политики, чтобы определять программы реформ своей страны. Так что там везде, где разработается реформа Украины, там везде, где политические силы и общественные организации работают для будущего Украины, там Европейский фонд за демократию хочет и будет помогать. I mean, it, 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 might be, it, it might be interesting to, just in response to this question, to know what the, the European Endowment for Democracy is doing for this conference. So what the European Endowment for Democracy is doing for Mislitiz Ukrainao is bringing in cultural journalists from Europe, not just Western Europe, but from all over Europe, so that they can take part and also think with Ukraine. This is the kind of things that the European Endowment for Democracy does. And I would stress that, although I'm very happy to have Mr. Pominovsky here, we have about 25 partners, most of them Ukrainian, all of them doing a little bit or a little bit more to make this enterprise happen. And in that sense, we're very happy to take part in, in, in our own very small and modest way in a certain kind of civil society. We couldn't do this without lots of individuals and without lots of little small groups helping us from the ground up. Thank you. We have a question here, please. Uh, Elizabeth Pond, IP Journal Berlin. Um, I, Mr. Snyder, you're, I came here expecting you to want to change the narrative of what's happening. After listening to your talk yesterday, I realized that you want to change several narratives. Uh, and I wonder which narratives are the most important ones that you want to change and in what direction? Okay. I mean, that's, that's a very difficult question because you're assuming that everyone in the room has been following my intellectual preoccupations step by step. And I'm afraid, happily, that's not Every true. Happily, moment. people have lives and you know, do other things besides follow Snyder. In, in the case of Ukraine, um, it's, as, as I told, when, when Leon called me uh, with the idea of organizing this conference, I told him that, you know, in all of my articles about Ukraine, what I am doing is playing defense, which is true. I, I am not concerned about establishing a historical narrative for Ukrainians. That is a job for my very talented Ukrainian colleagues and other historians of Ukraine who are from beyond Ukraine. There, and there should be no one narrative, by the way. I mean, it, the, the reducing the history of a nation or a continent to a narrative, I think, is a step towards tyranny. Because a narrative is something which consumes everything else, it marginalizes other things. Um, I, I believe that what I am doing is playing defense in the sense that I see certain narratives that are too strong, both intellectually and politically, and which cannot be defended historically. So, for example, the idea that Ukraine is not a nation, um, or the idea that, um, that because something was called Novorossiya, therefore there's, there was no Ukraine. Um, the idea that you know, all Ukrainians were collaborators. Historically, these are ridiculous ideas, and any historian can play defense and explain why these things are not true, at the very least that things are more complicated than that. I, I do not think historians have the job or for that matter, philosophers, or anyone else has the job of standing up and making a, narr a narration for the nation. I'm a pluralist. I believe that there should be lots of different stories. But I also believe that the more mendacious and false a story is about history, the more dangerous it is for the present. And that therefore, historians do have the responsibility to stand up and try to stop certain things, at, at least where they can. So that, that, those are my commitments, since you ask. Okay. I would add one thing to what my friend said, which is that the figure who is most actively trying to change the narrative right now is Putin. Uh, that's the business he is in, not just the business of aggression and destabilization and the use of force, but he has now presided over and has accepted an, an old, new Russian chauvinist narrative, both about Russia and about the Ukraine, that is in fact a revival of an old terrible story, but presented once again freshly on the occasion of his attempt to justify his aggression. And I think that one of, the, one of the stirring things about what's been happening in Ukraine, in Kiev, 
is the refusal of Ukrainians to accept that narrative. Um, the refusal to accept that narrative, that conception of Ukrainian identity, that conception of not just Ukrainian history, but of regional history. Um, and in that sense, this really is a struggle over the past as well as over the future. Um, and that, that, well, et cetera. Thank you. A question there, please. Uh, Antoli Babinski, Religious Information Service of Ukraine. Uh, my question is uh, for a historian, Mr. Uh, Snyder. During the whole history, um, churches played a great role in different social transformations uh, in, in Ukrainian history. What do you think about the today role of uh, different churches in Ukraine uh, in, the, in, in our crisis? Mm -hmm. yes. Well, I, I see this from a distance. You, you see it from much closer. I'm sure you understand many things that I do not. But what has impressed me has been the ecumenical character of the religious response. That is that uh, Ukrainian churchmen um, from all varieties of Christianity as well as, as Islam and Judaism have had no trouble standing together on a stage or speaking together. That is not so, that is not seen in every society, right? I mean, you may take it for granted, but it's not so easy to arrange things like that, even in my country, for example. So the ecumenical character has been very impressive. And the other thing which has been very striking has been the way in which different religious traditions in their own different ways, uh, with very few exceptions, have made it clear that they feel comfortable working within the Ukrainian state, um, that they are patriots in the kind of in, in the constrained, precise sense that they support the Ukrainian state, they believe they can work within the Ukrainian state. That has been something which has been quite interesting um, to observe because you, you're, you're quite right in saying that religious authorities have played a an important role in the history of Ukraine, but not always in that sense. So there you have it. We have a question here in the back, please. Hi, Gulliver Craig, France 24. I have a question for Timothy Snyder. Yesterday in your talk, if I understood you rightly, you said you thought the Maidan marked the end of Ukrainian foreign policy being defined by oscillation between East and West and Ukrainian internal politics being defined by the struggle between different oligarchic clans. What makes you so confident about the second part? <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> you may have understood me all too well. <laughs> no, no. The f so the first part, East and West, th is no longer possible because East and West no longer exist. Russia's not, Russia's no longer an alternative towards which you can point. Russia is now a project which embraces you if you're Ukrainian. Um, the struggle between oligarchical clans, I, I, the, 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 the point was something slightly different. Yanukovych, as I understand matters, again, there are people here who know these things much better. As I understand matters, Yanukovych was different from previous presidents in that he was not playing the game of balancing this clan, this clan, this clan, marrying into this clan, you know, et cetera. He was playing a different game, which was trying to get all of the clans beneath him, turning, turning even the Donetsk clan into something where he was at the top. As I saw things, this rightly or wrongly, this was a new game, a new kind of centralization which hadn't existed in Ukraine before. So, and the Maidan succeeded in stripping, in stopping that. It succeeded in stopping the attempt of the president to become the oligarch in chief. It did not make impossible the return to politics as a competition of other oligarchs. It, that, it did not make that impossible. I mean, I think the, the, the Maidan was largely from, I, as I see it from the left, it was largely about the rule of law, the ability of smaller and medium sized people in business to move upwards free competition rather than constrained competition. But it did not succeed in all of that. So no, no, I, I accept the premise of your question. I think what's very important now is that those people who have been successful under prior conditions in Ukraine become the patriots who endorse the rule of law in Ukraine and give everyone else a chance, right? I'm not saying that's bound to happen. I'm just saying that's what I hope will happen. One more question here, please. Martha Brzezewski told me I'm gloriously retired from everything. Uh, I would like to be a little <laughs> bit provocative and mention that in addition to churches, there is another church in Ukraine, and that is the Sacred Church of Scholarship, 
uh, both in the universities and in the Academy of Sciences, which has been singularly quiet. And I notice that it's not participating in this very important conference. Uh, have we written them off finally and completely? Have they ceased to participate in the conversation? Or have we just given up? Uh, um, but that's uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, no, dear colleague, no, no. I, uh, on the contrary, um, on the contrary, I mean, if one looks at participation in the Maidan, the, the role of students, I mean, as you know well, and faculty, from, no, and faculty from, from universities in this city, in Lviv, and elsewhere was, was quite considerable. I mean, and I know this because I, I was in touch with them at the time, and I've been collecting some of their memoirs about the Maidan. And as far as the, the, the institutions, um, they are very much involved in, in what we're doing. The, the, this, this conference we're organizing now, really this Congress of Intellectuals, has been organized with the help of precisely the Kiev Mohila Academy, where we have, I think, five public lectures, including Bernard Levy later this afternoon. I was yesterday, and then there are three more after that, including wonderful people like Paul Berman and Ivan Karastyev, Slavinka Drakulic, and all of that is happening at the Mohilanka. And of course, our participants, um, you know, roughly half of them are people who have prominent positions in Ukrainian universities. And I would emphasize this, not just here in Lviv, but also in, in Kharkiv or in, in Donetsk. So no, the, the universities are very, I mean, how important they have been in the Maidan and the revolution is, is for Ukrainians to judge. But they're certainly present for us. And indeed, one of the things that we, we, we hope to make clear is that we are here to learn from our Ukrainian colleagues. We believe that the people that we have invited have something to teach us um, and that we, are, we feel ourselves to be privileged that they will join us in, in Kiev. We've traveled to Kiev, but they're traveling to Kiev too and we're very happy that they can. Right there. Good morning, Olga Vakalo, Zaporizhia, State Radio Radio Company. Український історик Ярослав Грицак ще задовго до подій, які трапилися, стверджував, що модернізувати, реформувати країну, яка розколена навпіл, ну, принаймні, поділена дуже сильно, неможливо. Чи можна реформувати країну і модернізувати, коли частина її анексована, а частина дуже напружена, я, йдеться про Схід і Південь, і чи є якісь успішні випадки в історії, чи ми тут унікальні можемо бути? Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, e e yes, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make it simpler. There, there's no question that um, the Russian intervention stopped certain processes that were underway. But if you, if you for a moment put aside, put aside the main news story, which is the Russian intervention, and you read the record of legislation that has been passed, it's actually pretty impressive. Um, and in general, although thing, uh, the intervention makes it harder, we do know from history that you can modernize under difficult conditions. So a lot, I mean, it's a terrible analogy because it's so depressing, but a lot of the modernization of Poland took place while Poland, I mean, was under foreign occupation. Um, it's the most impressive Polish thinkers were educated in you know, Russian or Prussian or Austrian universities. Now that's a drastic comparison and I'm not wishing that you be partitioned three ways, but I'm just pointing out that this is part of the normal historical situation of East, in Eastern Europe. But yeah. Well, I'm quite uh, squeezed to speak about Polish history in front of Timothy Snyder because being a Pole, I have to, I have to say that Timothy knows better my own history than I do. But that's exactly the right uh, example. In 1918, 19, 1920, there was Tuchachevsky cavalry coming from the east, almost reaching Warsaw. There was a referendum 
in Silesia between Poland and Germany, and there was a uprising in Poznan. And all these uh, three years, there was nothing like a one Poland, but we had to create state, we had to start normal functioning. So modernization is uh, possible and is needed. So in a sense, uh, that's exactly what I meant when I was saying there should be no excuse for modernization, reform, and democratic path for, uh, for Ukraine using those arguments that we are not ready for. You are ready, and you have proven this. Can I say one thing? I want to say one thing a little abstract in general about that, which is that um, history has shown again and again that the one thing that oppression cannot do is rob the oppressed of their historical agency. It's impossible. It's impossible. Havel had that famous concept of the power of the powerless. Now, you're not powerless, but you're in trouble. And it'd be very important to understand that Putin, however far into Ukraine he can reach, he cannot reach into the Ukrainian mind if you don't want him to. And so it, it, and we see this over and over, people in dire historical circumstances acting freely and in some cases in the long term effectively. Um, and the important thing in circumstances in which outside assistance is not arriving yet, um, and we can talk about that, and in which one feels besieged and beleaguered and oppressed, is to bear that lesson in mind, that in some way you, I in a deep sense, Ukrainians control the future of Ukraine, and, 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 or at least they will as long as they understand that Putin cannot rob them of that. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more questions, if possible, here. One, a quick one. Sir, the, the New Republic interviewed me in 2000 at the Reform Party National Convention. During that convention, uh, the Ross Perot people, even Donald Trump, sent me a letter considering me as a potential VP candidate. I considered running for president at that time. Uh, Dana Milbank of your organization interviewed me, and in that interview, which I could show you, discussed how I'd uh, organized classified deals with and even put words in Gorbachev's mouth during the first Gulf War. I know this area quite well, and <laughs> I see the West extremely eager to play a chess game with Putin, the chess master. In the process, tomorrow when you're in your analytical phase, looking at your beginning, middle, and end game strategies, you're going to be offered up and see over the past few weeks that you've been offered up a game of three-card Monty and a shell game, and you've lost your money even before you get to play the chess game and put your money down. So keep that in mind, and you will realize that energy policies have to be trilateral. You have to buy at a good market rate. You have to be able to broker gas in Ukraine, and the West has to be able to buy that at a reasonable price to subsidize. Energy is the priority issue, and I would suggest buying out Gazprom next month at the shareholders meeting you, seeing IMF funds, etc. I would be happy to do that. I lack the means. Um, yeah, that seems like a nice recommendation. Just no. buy Gazprom and, yeah, uh, have a question. My name is Sedor Baschak, I come from Bratislava. I've always, wanted, I've always wanted to own an international yeah, yeah, energy yeah. company. Yes. <coughs> Former Czechoslovakia. My question uh, is about when we had revolutions in 89, uh, that was an epoch breaking events too. Uh, nothing like that happened in, in, in Prague, like gathering of, s of these bright minds in Czechoslovakia. Timothy Garton has, has, has come to Prague. But he was still a young man, nobody knew him. Uh, I, my question is, uh, what has happened to intellectuals in the meanwhile? Uh, did they become more activist? Or, uh, because in that time, they were observing those events from distance, from, the, from a distance. Now they are coming here into Kiel, discussing, proposing new things. So what has happened, in your view, to intellectuals oh. in, the, in those 25 years? Um. That's a huge subject. I would say that one of the reasons we came here was not just because we were concerned about the state of Ukraine, but because we are concerned about the state of Western intellectual life. That is to say, there are, you're right, there are, the, the, the intellectual apathy that you described about 1989, by the way, I think is somewhat exaggerated. It wasn't just Tim Garton Ash. But I think you're right to say that certainly in the United States, or to worry, 
that in the United States, intellectual life, like a lot of American life, has sort of withdrawn from the world in some way, has sort of pulled back. Um, we are a big and very self-involved country. Um, and I think that one of the things that we're trying to establish for our colleagues back home in Europe, whatever, is an internationalist frame of mind. That is to say that, um, that where there are situations in which the outcome of a conflict depends substantially, not entirely, but substantially on ideas and not just on power, um, then intellectuals have a role to play, humbly, modestly. Um, I don't know if we're great minds. I, we certainly are not here to give you the answers. Um, but we are here to demonstrate by example that there are scholars and Western scholars and Western intellectuals who insofar as they have pondered certain ideas and certain historical models of crisis and reform and progress and revolution and transformation and the attendant dangers, insofar as we have done this, we may have something to bring to the conversation. And in bringing the, this to the conversation, I have to say, and we're, we're here also because this is consistent with our conception of what the role of the intellectual in the West and everywhere else should be, should be. The direction of your question is that things have gotten better or that things have gotten worse? Better. Things are better? Yeah, I, yeah. so <laughs> I, I would just, I'm not sure I agree with the premise. I mean, when, when one looks back at 1989, um, there, were a, there were a lot of very impressive European and North American journalists who, who, who wrote well about 1989. There were a lot of people who tried very hard to understand communism for better or for worse. There were a lot of people who learned Russian and other East European languages. I think that's all less true now. Um, I think it's rather striking, as Leon suggests, how provincial American intellectual life has become since the end of the Cold War. I have been personally disappointed by how provincial European intellectual life has become. That was a surprise for me. You can't surprise me with American provincialism, but you can, I mean, I'm from Ohio, but you can surprise me with European provincialism, and I've been surprised by the degree of European provincialism. So w the way I see it, again, echoing Leon a bit, is that w this is not 1989, where there really was one system and another system. This is 2014, in which your experiences in Ukraine are like our experiences, but more so. I mean, this is a situation in which we are all actually in it together, but we haven't learned to see it that way. And par so part of what we are up to, again, in our own very limited and humble way, is trying to help ourselves see this as a common intellectual, ethical, cultural, and political predicament to establish some of the relationships that will be you know, helpful in the years to come, whether it's in Kiev or Berlin or Washington, DC. Because this is, a, this is a, the problems in Ukraine are universal problems. You feel them in Ukraine, the Ukrainians feel them in Ukraine. But these issues of pluralism, of the integrity of a state, of the possibility of integrating into larger um, European institutions, these are universal questions. And so the, the, the debt of respect that we're trying to pay is that Ukrainians here have done something that we have not done. We want to recognize its value and use it as an occasion to renew essentially universal conversations. Not thinking that this is going to immediately change for the political world, but perhaps thinking that as an act of respect, as an act of solidarity, and as the beginning of new relationships, it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be worthwhile. The, the, as I see it, the events in Ukraine are a chance for renewal um, of, they were a renewal of Ukrainian intellectual life. I mean, that goes with, that's obvious to anyone who reads the language. But they're a chance for a renewal of European and transatlantic intellectual life. And I'm trying to do what little I can so that we seize that chance. Can I add one thing? I'm sorry, can I, just, I just want to add one thing to complete the picture. There is a debate going on among American and more generally Western intellectuals that was occasioned by Ukraine and about what the Western response should be to Ukraine. We are not representative of all that the intellectuals in the West think. There are prominent Western intellectuals and writers and journalists who believe, for example, that the United States, if it isn't careful, will fall into a new Cold War as a consequence of the crisis in Ukraine, and that we should not fall into a new Cold War because it will be like the last Cold War, which was a terrible thing. Some of us think the last Cold War was actually a glorious thing that ended rather well. 
Um, but there are people who believe that in the wake of the war in Iraq, the United States must not intervene in a variety of ways for all sorts of reasons. There are views about the role of America in the world, about the use of force in the world, of American and Western power in the world. These are all very contentious issues uh, in the West, and not all of us who are here have the same views about them. Not all of us have the same views, but, th but, 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 but I, I don't want, th but there is, there is a fundamental debate going on. Um, Obama's response, I think we can characterize it as not the most forceful it could have been. Some people approve of that, some people don't. But the discussion of Obama's response to Putin's aggression has occasioned a larger discussion about the history of American and Western involvement abroad, about the nature of intervention abroad, the proper or improper reasons for that intervention. There are fundamental issues that, West, that Western intellectuals are debating as a consequence of your revolution and what you've done here. Let me just add uh, a, a, a few words on this as uh, I see myself uh, less intellectual, more a policy maker. When I was here for the second time in February and I came back, uh, uh, from Maidan to Brussels, I said to my friends, uh, uh, my impression, and it, it's true, is that one day in Maidan counts for one month in the real life. The people are maturing so rapidly. And there is nothing more exciting, I guess, for intellectuals to understand this and to bring message to uh, their countries and also to understand this for the benefit of the Ukrainians themselves. So I think this is what is so exciting for all of us being here today and uh, debating uh, a EU revolution with you for the benefit of us and for the benefit of you. Thank you. Thank you. There are two more questions, if possible, on the other side of the hall. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe final ones. Добрый день, Филипп Дикань, интернет издание Медиапорт, город Харьков. Здорово говорить о демократии с теми, кто понимает, что это такое, разделяет ее ценности, потому что все так или иначе понимают друг друга. А, но вот что бы вы сказали представителю русского мира, речь вовсе не обо мне, я, я не из тех, а, чем демократия все-таки лучше тех идей, которые проповедует русский мир? Спасибо. That's the nice way how intellectuals are <laughs> manipulating, uh, uh, yes, with the, with, the, with the people that are not so fast in thinking as they are. Well, um, let, me, uh, let me answer this time in, in English. Uh, I, I strongly believe uh, that, uh, and I have listened to uh, uh, this message uh, from the Professor Zubo from Moscow, that he said that uh, uh, the Putin's propaganda today and, uh, and the type of narration he builds, it's like narcotic, it's like drug to its own people and sooner or later they will wake up. So uh, what democracy is, is to live without drugs and narcotics, is to live in the real world, to have ability to speak, to have ability to understand and to protect your own life in a way you wish to. So, uh, and to be respected. Uh, and I think uh, there is no uh, single definition, there is no single model. Uh, that's why I strongly always avoid democracy promotion uh, uh, expression. I always say support to the people who are fighting for democracy in their country because each country, each society has to build a democracy on its own and has to adapt uh, themselves to the way how they would like to understand. But there is a clear division line to avoid caricature of democracy. And that is exactly where the wisdom is needed. And the wisdom are, is today. I guess I would add to the, what my friend has said that alongside the obvious dimension of freedom and the various freedoms, there is the matter of accountability. The accountability of individuals and above all the accountability of governments and states. That, they be, that there be institutions for such accountability, journalistic institutions, judicial and legal institutions, cultural institutions, and that a society in which a government is accountable has an infinite advantage over societies in which governments are not. We know, for example, from research, from famous research, that many of the great famines that took place in the 20th century had nothing whatsoever to do with the supply of food. It had to do with political decisions based by, uh, by governments that were not accountable for their, for, uh, for their actions. Whereas in, in countries in which governments, there is some transparency and there is some accountability, we know that there have been fewer famines. 
Um, and by, f and there are, and by this, in this famine, I mean food famine, but there are famines of religion, there are famines of culture, there are economic famines, there are famines of ideas, all the famines you can imagine. Where there is accountability, famines tend not to recur. And I think that is, I think that is immensely, immensely important. I guess the, the one little thing that I would add apropos Ruski Mir is that democracy only works with the idea of a citizen. And one of the problems with the recent Russian rhetoric is that it does away with the citizen and replaces him with the member of an ethnicity. So a citizen is someone who has a reciprocal relationship with the state. The citizen owes the state his taxes, his vote, his loyalty. The state owes the citizen protection, the rule of law, freedom. When you do away with the citizen and you start talking about Russian speakers or brotherly peoples or a special Russian civilization or a Ruski Mir, you have done away with something very important because then a Russian is no longer someone who has a relationship with the state. A Russian is just a tiny, a tiny, tiny part of a larger narrative, of a larger story, a story which is being written from above, right? So the, the, the citizen is something which is very important. When you talk about protecting people because of their ethnicity, it might sound good at first, but what's actually happening is the whole idea of citizenship is being done away with. So I tend to think that in Russia, one of the things which has to happen is that the notion of citizenship has to be reclaimed. One of the ways this narcotic works is that it makes people forget that they are citizens. It makes them believe that they're part of a larger story. And unfortunately, when you wake up from the narcotic trance, you realize that someone else was writing the story. Thank you very much. And the final question, please. Скажите, пожалуйста, воспринимают ли в Европе Украину как часть Европы? Ну, то есть тут что-то сейчас происходит. Ну, что-то происходит в Африке, в Латинской Америке. Там тоже бывает что-то плохое. Вот Украина – это часть Европы. Вот Прибалтика в свое время была однозначно часть Европы, но я имею в виду в голове европейцев, да, не на карте. А Украина – часть Европы или нет в головах ваших? Is, is Ukraine part of Europe as well, considered by Europeans? Are there, are there, any, are there any Europeans here? <laughs> <laughs> Europeans. So again, it falls to Mr. Pajanovsky. Как-то кажется здесь, что я один европейчик между этими трема спикерами. Так что я просто могу вам ответить, да, Украина – это часть Европы. Я об этом не сомневаюсь абсолютно. Так что... Это самый, думаю, простой uh, ответ вашему вопросу. Thank you very, very much for coming and for spending time with us for such a nice conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. very much. This was a Dume experience. <laughs>